Welcome everybody to today's Clinical Lunch and Learn webinar series brought to you by the Clinic Technical Assistance Center of New York. We're very excited to bring to you today a webinar on play therapy and trauma treatment with children presented by Michaela Millen. And now before I introduce our presenter, I just want to orient you to the webinar, especially if you haven't been on one of our webinars before. On your screen on the right hand side, you're gonna see a panel. And on that panel, there is a chat box towards the bottom of that panel. So if you have any questions, comments, ideas, suggestions, feel free to type them into that chat box. There's a drop down that says send to, make sure you send to all panelists and click send. And that way all the panelists will be able to see your comment, suggestion, question or response. And we highly recommend and encourage everybody to really participate, share your thoughts, share your ideas, and there will be a few times that Michaela will also ask you some specific questions, and we really love to hear from you as well. There will be a poll that will pop up at a certain point of the webinar, and that will also pop up on your screen on the right-hand side. You would respond to that and submit when that time comes, and we'll also cue you um, to make sure to take a look on the right-hand side. Currently, everybody is muted, and you will remain muted throughout the rest of the webinar. If you'd like to communicate with us, please do so through that chat box. A little bit later, we will be showing a video. The video will be heard through the speakers of your computer, whether or not you're using the phone currently to listen into the presentation. So make sure you have the speakers of your computer on high so that you can hear the video. That link to the video, if for some reason you're having some technical difficulties, will be available on ctechny.com, along with today's webinar recording and the slides. So if you have some colleagues that haven't been able to make it to today's webinar, just check back to ctechny.com to access the recording, slides, any resources, as well as a link to that video. So without further ado, I'm very excited to um, introduce to you Michaela Millen. She is a licensed art therapist specializing in trauma and grief with children and families, focusing on play, mindfulness, and sensory integration. She has extensive experience both doing play therapy as well as art therapy um, with children in a variety of different settings. More recently, or currently, she's the art therapy supervisor at Sanctuary for Families. She is an alumni of NYU, New York University's graduate art therapy program, and is trained in trauma-focused CBT and integrated mental health and addictions treatment. We're very excited to have Michaela today to present to you from her vast expertise working with children in a variety of different settings around trauma and using play therapy. Thank you so much, Michaela. Thanks, Lydia. I'm really thrilled to be here today, and I'm really excited to see how much interest there is in this topic, because it's an extremely interesting topic to me obviously. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to just sort of get started with this. Um, our, hold on one second here. So our objectives for today, and I hope you'll come away from this webinar with, is um, an understanding of the basic principles of non-directive art uh, play therapy as it relates to trauma treatment. I need to learn a little bit about verbal reflective techniques. Um, to help children move through post-traumatic play and develop a sense of control and safety and explore ways that avoidance can um, arise with the therapist during traumatic reenactment. Um, so the way that we're going to sort of I'll give you a rundown of what we're going to go through today, we're going to start with just an introduction to play therapy, followed by the role of the non-directive play therapist and play therapy in general. Um, specific techniques for trauma treatment um, and post-traumatic play and interventions. Um, at the end, we'll go into some of that avoidance and secondary trauma, how that comes up while you're engaging in play therapy and some ways to sort of manage that. And we'll conclude with outcomes and symptom relief and you know, really tying together why it is that you would want to take this approach. Um, and we'll have a little time for question and answers as we finish. So I'm going to start with a poll here. Um, I just want to get—I just want to get a sense um, of how many of you already use play therapy in your work with child clients. So there's a poll that has popped up on the right-hand side in that panel. Just click your response. Do you currently use play therapy in your work with child clients? Yes, no, or no, but I'd like to start using. 
um, it with my child client. So please just click your response and click submit. And then in a few seconds, we'll see the results. All right, I'm going to take this time to just quickly um, give a little caveat here, which is that in addition to play therapy, um, my modality of specialty is art therapy. So uh, in art therapy treatment, we focus a lot on working within, the way we say this is working within the metaphor, um, or really staying within the narratives of the play. So if you notice that the language is a little different around this, um, the way that I'm talking about it, that might be, that might be why. So once we have enough responses, that poll, the results will pop up, and then everybody will get a chance to see who is in our audience and what is your current use or experience with play therapy. And there we have it. Oh, okay, great. Oh, I see that a lot of people currently use play therapy. Excellent. And then a few of you are also interested in starting. So hopefully this webinar will also be able to answer some of those questions that you may have. Yes. Yeah. So I guess we'll just start with uh, the beginning here, right? What is play therapy? So it's a modality of therapy that is primarily used with children or young adolescents. Um, it uses the act of play to explore thoughts, feelings, behaviors, memories, and experiences. Um, therapists is often invited to participate in the play. Um, it gently helps the child to explore conflicts while being supported by the therapist. It builds on this natural, innate process that most children already have um, and use to explore conflicts and to share their thoughts and feelings. And generally, it, it's usually with sort of free play activities, you know, so like unstructured activities that allow for a child to really create the whole narrative. So that typically will be with like dolls, kits, toy cars, animal figurines. Um, it can include, you know, like free drawing or free painting. But it could even include stuff that's a little less creative, like using like building blocks or rolling balls, you know, just to sort of engage in an activity um, you know, I mean, like young kids are really prolific at projecting all kinds of scenarios onto any sort of object. So even if you don't have um, like doll sets, you'll still see that kind of role play come up. I want to go over a little bit of vocabulary for anybody who may not be familiar with these terms because I'm going to use them a lot just as a sort of a shorthand um, so we can really get into the, the details of the technique. Um, so first of all, we're talking about non-directive play, but in order to really go into that, we have to look at directive play also. So in directive play, a therapist would really participate a little bit more in, in the play, really interact um, and guide a child towards certain identified issues or conflicts or towards resolutions. I mean, much like, much like modalities of verbal therapy, um, you know, like CBT, for example, is like a little bit more directive, right? The therapist is taking a more active role, deciding what, where things are going versus, you know, maybe something a little more like psychoanalytic where, you know, the client or the child really guides it, right? In non-directive play therapy, um, the child is really running the show. They initiate and direct the play, and the therapist is really just there to sort of support the child's process and allow the child to to come to a better understanding of their own problems. You know, it's very sort of client-centered, as, as we would say. I'm going to use this term enactment. Uh, it's an oldie but a goodie psychoanalytic term. Um, so it's like when a person externalizes a past, you know, relational conflict by creating a similar conflict in the present moment. This can come up sometimes in play therapy um, as children will sort of put you in a certain role within the, the play narrative. and and it's important to realize that that is not an exact replication necessarily of the abuse, of the traumatic event. It may be like a slight translation, and they're just sort of mapping a certain dynamic onto you. Um, and it's important to sort of differentiate that from reenactment, which is usually an, a pretty exact, um, an exact replaying of the traumatic event. Uh, and you may not be very involved in that. I mean, the child may not even be acknowledging your presence very much during a reenactment. Uh, avoidance, it's a coping mechanism uh, in trauma and secondary trauma response. It's one of the clusters of trauma symptoms. Um, I want to highlight, the reason why I'm putting this in here is I want to highlight that it is a coping mechanism. I mean, if you're not able to, 
you know, cope, like manage the emotions that come up with a certain traumatic event, one of the most adaptive things you could do is try to avoid it. You know, so children have avoidance, but therapists also have avoidance, um, you know, based on the fact that we are human and sometimes we don't feel completely adequate to handle a situation when it comes up. And then sort of resolution as it comes together in traumatic play. Um, it's really just about having, you know, maybe some sort of meaning making, but also like a sense of reparation in the world of pretend. You know, we don't very frequently, it's just not possible to really have reparation in the real world around a traumatic event. I mean, the person who was the abuser may not be available to have reparation with. They may not be capable of, of really engaging in a process around that. But one of the things that's so special about play therapy is that in this mode of pretend, we can have some resolution in that, you know, and, and it really allows for processing these feelings on a little bit of a deeper level and finding some relief. So throughout this webinar, I'm going to use I'm going to use this one case example. I'm not going to go into this too deeply, but I'm just going to use the same child to illustrate some of the the techniques I'm going to talk about later. So I'm going to start out by giving you a little background. Um, I had a six-year-old client. Uh, some time ago, who experienced like very severe abuse and neglect. Um, he was basically isolated in his home for a couple of years, almost continuously. Um, he was very, very intelligent, but because because of his his parents' limitations and being so isolated, his speech was really, really delayed, um, and he had a lot of unusual sort of idiosyncratic language for things that made it really difficult to communicate with me because I couldn't understand what he was saying most of the time. And as a result, you know, we knew some things about his history um, when he was found and placed in foster care, but really didn't know any of the details of the trauma because he was just not capable of, of telling anybody exactly what happened. Um, but there were all of these indications of, of very severe abuse. You know, he was engaging in enuresis around the foster home, um, but, like, not intentionally, I mean, really, like, just, um, you know, huge indications of neglect, very um, violent outbursts with, with certain individuals that appeared very, like, trigger-specific. Um, he had specific phobias. In particular, he had a huge phobia around the bathroom and being in certain places alone. And then he was also witnessed to have these dissociate symptoms, you know, where the foster parent would report talking to him and saying something, and then suddenly it was like she didn't even know where he was. He'd just be staring off into space, you know, kind of frozen. And I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let you hold on to that information for a little while. But you know, the, that sort of symptom presentation, I I would say, is fairly common for for a child that would really benefit from play therapy because it is it is a verbal modality, but it it doesn't require someone to be quite as articulate. Um, and it actually helps them to develop some of that language. So, you know, non-directive play therapy, again, is really client-centered. Um, Virginia Axline was really the pioneer of this, but she was also um, a student of Carl Rogers. Uh, and she used a lot of that, um, the verbal reflective technique that we're going to go over is very much based on this. And uh, it's based on this idea that clients really have their own innate capacity to find solutions to their own problems. Right, so it's about reflecting the feelings in such a way that the child can gain insight into his, uh, her behavior. And the reason why play therapy is really helpful, in particular with, with PTSD symptoms, is that, you know, it really breaks down this isolation piece that comes up in trauma response. I mean, there's something, I think, that is just innately supportive and empowering about the child centered approach when you work with, with kids with trauma because, um, you know, trauma really takes your power away and it takes away your sense of control. Um, and a lot of that sense of powerlessness manifests in these avoidance symptoms like, you know, isolation, feeling of estrangement, these like self-blaming, denial, this distorted worldview where the trauma is normal. Um, so there is something, you know, in and of itself that's therapeutic about just having another person there to bear witness to that experience and to help recontextualize it a little bit. Um, and also, you know, one of the things that makes, dif makes it difficult to engage in trauma treatment with anybody, I mean, regardless of their age, 
is the fact that the symptoms themselves will often um, will often inhibit the person from actually talking about the most difficult parts of the trauma, which is usually where symptoms stem from, you know? And uh, frequently there will be these like less difficult parts of the trauma that they'll bring up more easily. And being able to project this into another realm, um, you know, in this case, it's like the realm of play, creates a little bit of space so that usually people's symptoms are not quite so severe and they can talk about some of that more difficult material um, because they're talking about it, you know, this is this is what the this is what the little boy doll is feeling, you know, this isn't what I'm feeling, this is what happened to him. Um, and yeah, in the interest of time, I, I would love to get into some some articles that really study how this can be helpful. Um, but I will, you know, I'd be happy to send some out to anybody who's interested. There's some great longitudinal studies that really show a huge difference. Um, you know, and I will say that in TFCBT, um, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, play is huge in, like, making that material come alive. So much like any other type of therapy style, you know, the role of the therapist is really critical. Um, because you're not really directing the play, it, the way that you sort of hold the space, the way that you reflect the feelings and behaviors back, having that kind of unconditional positive regard, there's that Carl Rogers coming in here, um, really creating a permissive environment where anything can be expressed. Um, it's not on the video coming up, but you know, if you, if you go on YouTube and you look for some play therapy videos, you'll often hear this lead into the session early on where you know, the therapist will really say, like, I want to let you know that you can say anything in this session, you can do almost anything as long as it's safe. You can, you know, anything that you want to do is okay here. Like really creating that space that where the rules are suspended a little bit. Um, and yet also setting these boundaries when necessary to ensure that holding environment um, and also to ensure safety. And I'm going to talk about that, you know, a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. But keeping that you know, the whole idea of holding the space and creating this safety, um, you know, and engaging in sort of more, I guess, more typical play activities early on in treatment, it's so that this post-traumatic play can happen. Like, if the post-traumatic play is happening, that means you're doing a good job. Uh, this is where we want to get, because you can, you could easily just engage in a play activity with a child for many sessions on end without getting into any material that you know, really feels like therapy. Um, and I think, you know, on the one hand, it's an indication that you've created a safe space when it, when it comes up. And it's also your opportunity to really create those boundaries where you're showing to them that they're not going to completely lose control um, in the session with you. So I want to define this a little bit more before we get into exactly how it is that you do that. Um, Ileana Gill is a really great resource for looking into specifically the post-traumatic play. Um, you know, she defines it as the reenactment during which the child attempts to gain mastery by exploring traumatic material within the realm of play, characterized by a ritualistic play scenario um, that is very literal and devoid of apparent enjoyment or freedom of expression. Uh, ritualistic play can frequently be identified by like violent, punitive, or sexual content within the play scenario. Um, oftentimes, there's an accompanying language which is inappropriate or, you know, sounds beyond the developmental level of the child, um, similar to, like, scripting when, you know, like, toddlers will repeat entire adult phrases ver verbatim, um, and you can tell that they're not exactly sure what it is that they're saying. Uh, and the key aspect of this that I'm going to, I'll keep mentioning this as we go through the other techniques, but the disturbing content is disturbing to the top to the child, not just to you, um, meaning that you will, you'll typically see a real shift in the child's um, experience. Like, you know, with, with abused children, you'll often see kids get into these like sort of violent or like sexualized play scenarios where they appear to still be enjoying the play, you know, they're smiling, they're still like interacting with you, and it is disturbing often to, to the therapist to see the child interact in this way but the child doesn't appear disturbed. Um, and that, so that's not necessarily traumatic play, just because the content seems adult to you. 
usually the major indicator of that is going to be you're going to really see the, the whole demeanor of the child is going to change. You start to see that flat expression come up. Um, usually there's a significant disconnect that happens between you and the child where they're not really like engaged with you anymore. Um, it often looks like something like a, like a trance state, you know, or even looking like a little bit frozen, and that's because there's some degree of dissociation occurring there. And like I said before, this really serves a purpose, you know, I mean, being able to engage in this in the session, this is what makes it different than a child just playing on their own, you know, I mean, the reason why you're there is that due to their developmental level, they're not capable of fully resolving this without a little bit of help. You know, and they need you there to kind of hold the space that they can actually move through it instead of what we call, like, you know, becoming, becoming fixed, right, which is where instead of, like, gaining mastery, getting understanding of what happened, what they're doing is they're just replaying it over and over again, you know, and that's a little more of, like, an, it's like the symptom drive treatment when that happens, right, because they're just re-experiencing in front of you and they're not sort of gaining anything from it. So... Before we're going to get into some very specific techniques around like verbal verbal reflection, um, we're going to chat a little bit. I just want to hear a little bit of feedback from everybody. Um, I'll let Lydia yeah, sort of so, go over that. So on the right hand side, there's that chat box, and if you've been seeing some messages from a few of us there, that's exactly where your chat will pop up. So there's a just submit kind of your responses on the drop down. Click send to all panelists, and then send. So we just have some questions for you. Have you ever had a client that has expressed traumatic play? Um, and it sounds that many of you are currently doing play therapy. Have you seen in, in some of that work, seen some of this traumatic play that Michaela, Michaela has talked about? What were some signs that this was happening? What really stood out to you? Um, what was this like for you as a therapist? Um, and while we're at it, we had one more question. Did you use any techniques or interventions before or after during traumatic play? So let's focus on that, those first few. What well, has your experience been in working with children around traumatic play? What were those signs that kind of told you that it was happening? And we have a couple kind of responses coming in. Please feel free to keep typing some of those. When a child, um, and let me just take a quick peek. When a child has experienced a stage where the issue is fixed, so that's a question. All right, they're coming in pretty quickly. So let me go back to that question in a minute. So we have some other comments. The child climbed under the desk. That's a very, you know, specific okay. kind of reaction, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not used. Uh, some have said that they haven't had a chance yet or haven't really seen the play yet. But another key indicator that some of you have said is avoiding eye contact, shouting no um, when greeted or start of session, um, minimal symbolic play. Um, Let's see, it sounds like there's, for some of you who have experienced this, you've seen some very specific kind of reactions. Um, one of you had said, I worked with five-year-olds who repeated the same scheme and sand play over the course of several months with little change. I wondered about being more directive. So that was a little bit more about, you know, what, the, what type of approach if you don't see the traumatic play. And it seems like that's some of the questions that are coming up. Mm -hmm. So if you don't get a chance to see that play, kind of what, what should you do? And I think we're going to talk a little bit about that as we move forward in terms of techniques. Yeah. There's one more question that we'd like you to type in about. Did you use any specific techniques or interventions before, after, or during the actual traumatic play? So we're talking about once the um, child really moves from regular or typical play to really kind of showing you the traumatic play, what are some techniques that you also use? Okay. I'm also, I'm, I'm flipping through some of these. There's a lot of really great responses coming in, and I think a number of them uh, I'm going to address as, as this goes along. But something that I'm noticing just coming through as a theme is um, I see a lot of people talking about, you know, children like hiding under desks or like flipping over the dollhouse um, or sort of, you know, suddenly disengaging, yelling no at the beginning of the session. And, um, you know, I really see a lot of those those actions as avoidance responses, right? That's like your, that's the indication to you that they're putting the brakes on for you. Um, and we're going, you know, I'm going to talk about this a little bit as we get into like the, well, right now, I guess, as we talk about like creating a safe space. But I think that although we do want the traumatic play to come up eventually, because that's where we can really address what's going on, 
at the same time, we really want to be mindful that this doesn't happen right at the beginning of therapy. I think that sometimes, and I'll, I'll include myself in this, um, you know, a number of years ago, that, you know, sometimes when it comes up early on in treatment, it feels really great, right? Because you're like, oh, you know, this child trusts me. They're bringing up, like, the real issues, you know. But um, it takes a little while to develop genuine trust within the therapeutic relationship and a genuine safe space. And so sometimes that material comes up prematurely um, just because they're so symptomatic. And it's like when the, when the child's kind of putting the brakes on for you, right, they're completely disengaging, they run out of the room, they flip over the dollhouse, that's kind of an indication that we need to, like, take a step back and really develop that, that safe space. And I, I wish I could talk a lot more about this. I'd love to do, like, a whole webinar just on safe spaces. But I'm just going to give, like, a, a little overview of this, um, a very specific technique is that, you know, early on in treatment, I, I really want to pay attention to what the child naturally gravitates to in the office that they seem to find soothing. Um, I try to make sure there's lots of, lots of different things um, around the office that could be soothing, really bearing in mind that my idea of soothing is not necessarily the child. You know, like people have very um, different sort of, uh, I guess, sensory responses to certain materials. So I want to really pay attention to the stuff that, that they find soothing. And also make sure that there's objects to soothe, like whatever it is that the play is, is uh, oriented within, right? Like play food and blankets and doctor kits and things we can use to take care of our characters that may be the ones that are directly um, experiencing the, the difficulty, right? So that would be like an example of being able to start to intervene a little bit um, really within the metaphor. Right, like maybe it's too soon for me to reflect to the child that I notice that they've become dysregulated, but I can reflect that like, you know, little, uh, I don't know, like little John seems like he's really having a tough time. I wonder if there's something that we could do for him, you know, maybe he could have a snack, um, you know, or something like that. Um, and also just like bearing in mind in general that some materials um, are a little easier to, you know, to project this material onto. And if someone's getting way, like, you know, the, I keep thinking of the, the comment somebody sent about the, the dollhouse and setting it up and sort of flipping the dollhouse over. And, um, you know, so in a case like that, I would almost think, like, maybe we're not quite ready for the dollhouse yet. Or, um, you know, really looking into, like, what, what is the purpose of flipping it over? Like, what is, the, what is that doing for the child to flip it over? And really looking into, like, what what is happening there, finding some way to kind of slow it down. I'm going to talk about that, too, um, eminently. So I'm going to focus primarily on verbal reflections and how we use verbal reflections to um, both interrupt and intervene in post-traumatic play. But, you know, some other techniques that, are, that can be helpful, and, you know, you can find this in the, in the literature, um, you know, if you start looking into this, you know, play therapy, there's also a sort of like redirecting and orienting. Um, that's, that can be an aspect of verbal reflection, but it's really more about keeping the child in the present space, moving you know, more seamlessly between the play space and you know, reality. Um, there could be guided soothing. That's something that, yeah, it's kind of similar to like guided meditation, but it's more applicable to young children, uh, really helping to create that safe space. The narrative approach can be very helpful that starts to get, you know, a, a little more on the edge of, like, directive, but not too much. You know, really, like, asking them to, to really work within the story, um, you know, and sort of creating multiple stories um, for the material that's being expressed. And, um, you know, as far as, like, how, how to sort of guide them through this process, you know, I feel like verbal reflections are one of those things that we, you know, we learn about so early on in school, and it's kind of, it's kind of simple, or it seems simple, right? Like you just re repeat back what it is that, um, what it is that you're seeing, uh, you know, or what it is that the child is saying. But the the key here is that, you know, on the one hand, you're avoiding these interpretations. You're not really adding your own stuff into it. You're not trying to like you're not helping them gain insight from the perspective of like giving interpretations that they can then take on themselves. 
Um, maybe all you're doing is just reflecting maybe the underlying feelings that are very obviously like visually observable. Um, you know, really keeping it still within the metaphor of the play. Or, you know, if you are observing like the feelings, it's really more the observed state of the child that you're, that you're observing. So we're going to have a video coming up here. And I want to just kind of give you, I want to let you know what it is I, I'd like you to look for in this. Um, I want you to notice kind of how, how he uses the little girl's language and sort of repeats it back in such a way that, you know, it's, it's very slightly different than what she said, but it's not really including any new material. Uh, I want you to notice the rhythm of it, the way that, the way that he kind of um, just like so gently moves things along and keeps it moving. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about creating a cognitive framework, and um, I want you to listen first just to, you know, what does he repeat exactly and what changes slightly, um, you know, and just noticing also her, her response to the way that he's speaking. So I'm going to let you guys just sort of listen to this. So make sure to use your computer speakers to hear the video and put them up high. Thank you, everybody. If anybody had uh, some difficulty viewing the video, sometimes it has something to do with the software that you have accessible to you in your um, in your office as well as the internet stream. So if for some reason you weren't able to hear or see that video properly, it's going to be linked on our website, ctechny.com, along with the webinar recording and slides. Okay, I'm, I'm taking a quick look through um, through some of these comments. There's so many really great, great questions and great comments coming in. Um, I'm going to try, there's some of these I'm really, um, I'm going to try to address these towards the end of the presentation because they're just, they're a little specific, but they're very, very relevant, very interesting here. Um, but, you know, sort of, you know, in regards to the video, I, I feel like, you know, I sort of love this guy. You know, he's so, he's a really great example of that, you know, on the surface, it seems like he's not really doing anything. And you're sort of like, I don't really understand why this is therapy, you know, or at least early on in like my training, I couldn't, it was hard for me to, to see it. But um, he really uses all these different types of verbal reflection. Maybe some of the later ones he gets into only at the end of the video. But, you know, there's like the direct observation. Um, in this case, you know, he really took a role in the play. So it's not, it's not quite as like externalized as working with dolls, right? But he's sort of reflecting, he's reflecting her behaviors. He's reflecting what he needs to do. He's also reflecting her words back in such a way that he can clarify what it is that she means. Um, you know, and I, well, I want to get into a little more of some specific interventions. So I just wanted you to get a feel for like what it, what it sort of looks like. Um, I see this comment coming in here. Um, you know, my, it says my favorite part was that he didn't help her with the math. He let her do it at her own pace, which hopefully helped her to feel more confident and comfortable. I think that that is, um, that is in essence, what is the difference between directive and non-directive play therapy? And, you know, I'm not, this isn't to sort of discount or say that directive play therapy doesn't absolutely have its place. Um, 
I think that when play therapy is done, you know, in a directive manner and it's done very well, um, it is not intrusive. It is not, you know, projecting the therapist's agenda onto the child at all. But I think that with, with trauma, though, it is just so easy for children to start to anticipate what it is that they think you want them to say. And they're so, you know, they're so um, attuned to your experience that you have to just remove yourself completely in order to let them have that sense of agency and control in the sense that anything that they say is okay. You know, you're not, you're not telling them what they're supposed to be feeling. Um, so, you know, when we're, he gets into this just a little bit at the end, but one of the major types of verbal reflection is where you're really like inviting the child to kind of project, externalize, and gain insight um, even more within, you know, within the space. So part of this, and I'll talk about this a little more when we get into like interrupting um, post-traumatic play, but part of this is that you're creating just a little bit of space in the narrative um, we are actually creating even more distance between uh, the child's feelings and what's happening within the play, which sounds like something that you wouldn't want to do, but you're actually allowing them to go deeper into the feelings associated with the trauma when you help to disconnect like what's happening with the doll or what's happening with the puppet and what happened to that child. Um, you know, and as far as like having more of a sense of control, I have this example here, um, you know, wondering aloud about what happened you're actually, you're really letting that child to take on a, a kind of omniscient role in the play scenario. You know, you're empowering that child that they're creating it in this particular case. Whatever's happening, you know, with the dolls and the puppets, they, they can actually control the outcome. And, um, you know, also he does this so beautifully, you know, where he sort of reflects the child's shifting behavior. Um, you know, that you can see like a, a longer video online if you're interested from from that link. But, you know, really, I mean, you're only reflecting what's actually observed, you know, what you notice the child's doing, um, not what you think the child's trying to do. And you're just like part of that sort of creating the, um, part of creating the cognitive framework is that, um, you know, sometimes people talk about like, well, you know, I don't understand what is the purpose of, of just reflecting what it is the child's doing. You know, the child knows what, what they're doing. You know, you're just sort of like narrating what's happening. But that's actually, um, that's very presumptuous. The child knows what they're doing when they're in this sort of state. You know, when, especially when, when you start to tap into that traumatic material, you know, the child is really engaged in this, in this sort of flow. I mean, that's what you want to happen, right? You want to like, part of that, um, in the video, he has this amazing kind of like, you know, sing-songy tone to his voice. You know, he creates this like flow where she's just able to like freely, freely play. Um, and he just sort of like keeps things moving along. And when people are in flow, they're not, you know, they're creating those narratives rather unconsciously. So one of the purposes of the verbal reflection in and of itself is that you're helping them, to, you're holding this mirror up that allows them to actually notice what it is that, that they're doing, you know, I, we can't take that for granted. Um, I'm going to move right along here. So, great. So you've got this post-traumatic play going and now it's like, well, what do we, what do we do? Um, this is where things start to get a little, a little tricky. Um, so we're going to talk about the difference between like interrupting the play and intervening. Um, depending on the situation, you may do one first or the other, but in general, like interrupting is a little bit, it's really, it's not such a, such a firm interaction. It's a little more gentle. Um, you know, and this, the reason why you would interrupt it is, you know, you're noticing that this certain narrative is becoming really fixed. Um, it's playing out the exact same way without any change in the narrative, right? You're noticing that, you know, the child is really devoid of that, that enjoyment of the play and it's just not changing, right? But it's the same, usually it's a rather unpleasant outcome um, coming to fruition again and again. So that's when you wanna interrupt it because you, you don't wanna just create a space where they have just strong re-experiencing symptoms with them. You wanna help things to become more flexible. So, you know, that sort of wondering aloud is, is one way that you can do that, right? Like I wonder if there's anything that we can do to to you know, help the 
help the little cat. You know, I wonder, I wonder what it is that this little girl is feeling. You know, I wonder how it feels to be, you know, trapped in the house again. This happens every week. She's just stuck there. Right, and inviting the child, like I mentioned before, to really detach slightly and kind of comment on the play scenario. You know, what do you think about what's going on with with the puppets? Um, if it's been sort of initiated before the traumatic play starts, uh, sometimes you end up taking on the role of a character, right? Like you have one of the dolls or the puppets or figurines, and just by just by being a you know a little a little more firm in your stance, you know, you can create a little bit of friction in the narrative by just not immediately launching into that same that same outcome. Uh, taking a break is another one that, you know, this is it, which really is an intervention. It kind of it sort of straddles between the two, but you know, I'm thinking like with this um, with this case uh, that I mentioned before, uh, and this actually relates to one of the comments that came up. One of the things that he did early on was, you know, he played a lot with the dollhouse, and he had this specific phobia around the bathroom, and, you know, inevitably, in the play scenario, it would get to, you know, time for the kid to take a bath, and the the scenario that would unfold is that he, the doll would be sort of, like, ritualistically bathed, you know, like, very roughly. Um, he would use actual water and soap for this. Um, he definitely would enter, like, a semi, you know, dissociated state. This is sort of this is related to the slide that we're on here. Why would you intervene with this? You know, like, well, this is like, you know, maybe the fourth or fifth time that he had, you know, he would want to wash the doll the whole session. Um, and at the end, the doll would be drowned. That that was the scenario. In that case, that was the unaltered, rigid narrative that had developed and it repeated many times at the same outcome. Um, you know, he was not very present when this was happening, right? Um, you know, he, he was unable to create any any flexibility in the narrative, um, and the the main thing that I could do early on was structure the session in such a way that I knew that the timing was such that he would um, he would not get to that part until close to the end of the session. He'd only have about two minutes to do it, and then I'd be like, "Oh, it's time for us to end today. I guess we just don't like we just don't know what happens to him today. You know, I guess he's still taking the bath, and we'll see next week what happens." Right, just me not really changing the narrative, just creating a little bit of space, um, you know, suspending that outcome for a moment. Uh, and real quick before before we sort of push forward here, um, you know, one of the other, just a little like, I guess, I don't want to say pitfall, but something that happens sometimes. Um, Sometimes therapists intervene in the play a little more based on their own avoidance stuff. You know, they're either like eager to rescue the character under stress and it halts prematurely because you're trying to change the outcome, uh, you know, yourself. You know, you're kind of pushing it a little bit too far. Um, sometimes the play seems really traumatic, um, you know, to you, the therapist. Um, and, you know, accidentally it just stops prematurely because you think the child is dysregulating. This is, you know, we're all human. It happens sometimes to all of us. Um, and also sometimes a therapist gets placed in the role of the abuser and it's really uncomfortable and you just want to get out of that role immediately. I mean, I think most therapists come into this field because we want to be helpful, you know, so we don't want to be in the role of, of an abuser in a play scenario. Um, you know, but creating these interruptions would be a great way to sort of to cope with our own avoidance responses also. I'm going to get to that a little bit more in a moment. Um, but you're really, that interruption, you know, or even the intervention, they're just to create a little bit of space in the narrative and consider alternate outcomes, right? It's empowering the child to look at the role a little bit differently. Um, giving them an opportunity to take on this role of the rescuer, you know, I mean, I think it's such a poignant sort of metaphor, you know, to try to engage a child in the role of rescuing, like, the externalized version of themselves, you know. I mean, it's, in that case, they're really finding that, that power and that safety from within, not from with you, or not from you. So, you know, these secondary avoidance responses, right, I, you know, as I mentioned before, the therapist starts to, you know, sometimes without meaning to, and I, I want to just emphasize that I think that to some extent, no matter how experienced you are, these feelings absolutely come up. You know, the difference is how do you handle them? 
Um, you know, I think most therapists are like good people. They don't want to hurt children. They don't like to be in that role. They don't like to see children suffer. Like these are all normal reactions that you don't want to see this child go through this. You want to like help them. Um, but if you rush in too quickly, um, you reinforce this idea that they need to be saved, right? And um, and obviously, if they're there with you, they weren't saved from their own traumatic experience, you know? So this is really about helping them have a sense of agency. Um, and I go into a little more detail about exactly why therapists typically will do this. Um, another another example is that, you know, that fear that, um, that will re-traumatize the child. Um, you know, no one wants to do that. It's a legitimate fear to have. I think it's especially, you know, when you do feel like it's getting fixed. Um, sometimes we're really eager to make sure that it doesn't it doesn't cause any damage, um, you know, or the child becomes aggressive during the post traumatic play and creates safety concerns, and um, inadvertently we really just like shut the whole thing down right away, um, you know, instead of instead of being a little more gentle in how we how we address these things. So keeping those verbal reflections um, are really the key to addressing your own secondary avoidance responses, also. Right? If we continue to you know, create that narrative, that cognitive framework, we're not just creating it for the child to understand what's happening, but we're helping us to stay really connected, you know, so we stay alert. We don't get you know, off into a semi-trance state, um, just like the child is. In my experience, that can, that can happen if you're not engaging really directly. You, know, you can sort of get that, um, that sort of disconnect. And also allows for these alternate outcomes in it and really, just even just the gentle exploration of those outcomes, even the smallest changes, really alleviates the risk of the child being re-traumatized, you know? Um, it's actually kind of difficult to re-traumatize a child through their own narrative if you're not adding stuff to it. Um, you just want to, you know, try to create the space that they can start to feel some, some kind of shift um, from the narrative. Um, and you're also kind of helping them to connect feelings and behaviors during those aggressive out outbursts, right? Again, it's that like gentle intervention without completely halting um, the play. And if you continue to really focus on these on these secondary responses, you know, as they as they come up in the verbal reflections, it's like the the more you stick with verbally reflecting exactly what you're seeing. The less you try to intervene, like there's really no risk that your that your avoidance um, is going to be driving, you know, the treatment. So, I mean, I guess looking at looking at the whole piece, you know, taking a step back here beyond that specific technique, um, you know, you're when you're creating a cognitive and verbal framework um, for these memories, you know, you're really helping you're helping to create a narrative or even just a, a more integrated, you know, on a, on a you know, neural level, you're helping to integrate these, you know, potentially very detached, um, you know, fragmented sort of sensory experiences. Just by being there, you're helping to provide this ego strength for them, and you're enforcing this, you know, or communicating to them this idea that, that they have the, the capacity to heal through this, or that they can come up with their own solutions. Um, you know, through through play therapy, I think our ultimate goal is that the child's going to develop an increased tolerance of feelings and memories and thoughts associated with the trauma, which can lead to this explicit processing, right, which is where you break the metaphor and we actually connect it to, to real life. And I just, you know, I want to make sure that we have time for questions, but I just want to emphasize that I think the real, the beauty to really sort of getting out of your own way in this process, right, and really letting the child direct treatment is that on an implicit level, um, you're, really, you're really avoiding getting into that rescuer role, and, and you're not creating this sort of dependence on the therapist that can happen sometimes, you know, because it feels, you know, it feels good and it feels like comforting for them and for you, but they're not going to be in therapy forever. And so the more that you give them this sense that, like, they can sort of go through this process and you didn't do much, you know, the more they own that resolution that they get from treatment. Great. Thank you so much, Michaela. I just want to make sure that we have some time um, as we have a, a number of questions that have come in. So um, I, I th that was a wonderful presentation, I think, really presenting a bit of the context around play therapy, but honing in on a couple of techniques that may be particularly helpful in working with children who have been traumatized. So I just want to get quickly to some questions. So 
um, uh, and we're gonna we're trying to get through as many as we can. Mm -hmm. um, so how, one question that came in earlier was, how would you suggest moving the therapy from where they are, just replaying the trauma over and over, to gaining mastery? Okay. Um, well, first of all, we need to sort of assess like how firmly they are rooted in the narrative. Um, maybe I'll just give a case example on this. I'll return back to that previous one. Um, so, you know, with this client that I had that was engaging in this, like, ritualistic bathing, um, you know, it certainly seemed very connected to what I did already know about him. I knew he had a specific phobia of the bathroom, right? So this was just that material. So the first step for me was just creating a little bit of space in the narrative that, um, you know, some sessions I would start, I wouldn't let him play with the, da the dollhouse. I wouldn't take it out until you know, maybe like more than halfway through the session so that we could stop the narrative before the doll was drowned, right? So that was like the first step. I think, you know, maybe the subsequent se session, I just didn't have the dollhouse that, that week. It's like, I don't know where it is. It's just, I don't have it this week. I just hit it, you know? So that we could spend, you know, one week kind of gaining a little bit of resourcing. And, you know, when I noticed slightly less, um, you know, dramatic versions of that detachment, I would actually reflect a little bit to him that it felt, sometimes it feels like he drifts away a little bit from me. You know, so I gave a little bit of time for us to, you know, deepen our connection or our sort of engagement with each other. And then the next time that it came up, then I directly reflected, you know, that I noted, like one that I noticed the narrative didn't change, you know, that he, all, the doll always, always drowns. You know, I wonder what that's like for him. And then really inviting him to consider, you know, like, I wonder if there's anything we can do. You know, like, I notice that his head's under the water. You know, can we, can we give him a pillow? Could we try, can we try doing the bath without the actual water today? You know, maybe he could take a shower. Just creating, like, a little bit of, of space to slightly, to slightly shift it. And, you know, while also respecting what he wants to do. Great. Thank you so much, Michaela. You know, we had somebody who also just asked if there's any role for the caregivers in, in, in some of this um, play therapy. Is it really just with focus with the child? What is the role of the caregiver? Well, I think that in the actual active play therapy, you probably don't want the caregiver there. Um, you know, I think that the, the role of the caregiver there is really in the collateral work. Um, in, in my experience, you know, the, the thing that comes up most with caregivers is that they will, they will sometimes they'll observe like actual like real you know post traumatic play in the home, but uh, more often than not they notice you know just disturbing narratives and they themselves get very triggered by it, and you know they want to kind of like learn from you how they're supposed to intervene, and a lot of that is around sort of actually trying to to create a little bit of space that you know the child's going to do that in therapy, and your job is really just to be just to be supportive you know and to not you know, not sort of create this sense of like passing judgment on what the child's doing, you know, like just, I would say less is more in this case, like in that early play therapy treatment. And, and most of the work I do with parents is going to be with me and the parent alone. And um, actually kind of managing a lot of their secondary trauma experience. Okay. And you know, we have a couple similar kind of theme kind of questions, which is if there's a lot of anxiety kind of created during the webinar, um, if there is, um, uh, for example, if somebody had said that the, the, the child had gotten worked up and then didn't want to come back again. How can you reduce that? How can you let, um, how can you kind of sort of reduce that anxiety and help ensure that you're really leaving on a good note so that it doesn't kind of scare the child away in that process? Any recommendations? Well, I think that in my personal view for the trauma treatment is that the more explicit you can be, the better. So I would actually really confront that very head on. I would actually observe the fact that I noticed that something happened that to me appeared that they became very uncomfortable. I would really take accountability for the fact that as the adult and the therapist, that I had some role in that, whether I meant to or not. Um, and I would really invite the child to sort of work with me on, on how we can create a space that doesn't feel so scary. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't beat around the bush on that. I would, immediate, I would actually start out by apologizing for what had happened, you know, that, that something happened and it seemed like you felt very unsafe and I'm sorry, you know, what can I do to help you? Um, we will take at least one more question as we're mindful of the time. So one, one question I think is also another theme, the types of questions are coming in is how long does it take to really get to a traumatic play? You know, earlier was like, how do you stop kind of reenacting it over and over again? And now it's sort of, well, how long does that process really take? How long does this treatment process take? I think it, 
it varies quite a bit depending on the nature of the trauma and also like how long it's been since the trauma happened. Like typically when the trauma is more recent and with younger kids, I find that if anything, a lot of times at the beginning of treatment, you're really like kind of pumping the brakes on it because they're going into it immediately and you're trying to slow things down. Um, with the older kids and with, you know, uh, you know, trauma that occurred some time ago, it may be a much longer process before they, before they feel safe to go there. Um, you know, so it's hard to give like an exact, an exact estimate of that. But I would say that in general, um, you know, it's pretty difficult to like really engage and develop therapeutic trust in like less than, let's say like four weeks, you know, of seeing a child. So I would say that, you know, you want to at least wait like a month, you know, to like six weeks to develop a relationship with a child before like really going deep into the traumatic play. Great. Thank you so much, Michaela. We have a number of other questions that have come in. I think what we'll do, if it's okay with you, is work with you to see if we can answer some of them and maybe post it on the CTEC NY.com website, yeah. um, and along with the webinar slides, recording, and a link to the video. So we will have that available to you. Amanda had chatted that link, but just go to CTECNY.com. Here there are some additional resources that Michaela had recommended um, that you may want to look at. And again, the slide, you can access them through the slides from the website. Our upcoming Lunch and Learn is on Helping the Helpers, Occupational Stress and Self-Care, presented by Cara Dean Estale and myself, Lydia Franco, Wednesday, August 6th from 12 to 1. An announcement will be sent out in the coming weeks so you can register for that. Um, please let us know if you, if you're, this is our first play therapy webinar. It seems that there was quite a bit of interest in it. Please um, fill out the feedback survey that's going to pop up when you close out of the webinar and let us know if there's any specific topics or areas that you would like us to um, uh, present around, uh, present around about um, specific to play therapy or any other clinical topic. We really do take a look at those feedback surveys. Please feel free to reach us or to reach us directly. Um, Michaela's email is michaelamillen at gmail.com. For any CTAC related questions, it's lydia.franco at nyu.edu. And again, feel free to go to our ctacny.com website. Um, please let us know if there's any additional clinical topic based webinars you'd be interested in. Um, went and, and complete that feedback survey that pops up at the end. Thank you again, everybody, for participating. You're wonderful participants, very active and submitting questions and comments and responses, and we really appreciate that. Thank you again, and have a wonderful day.